we go, folks. We're about to review. Where is everybody? The pilot for the Twilight Zone. Now, I've actually read some of the book. So, what he wanted to use, because Jeff was wondering about the status of the time element. Um, in order to make a pilot, the first thing Self needed was a script. Serling had written the time element, intended it to be the pilot, but it had just been done as a Desilu playhouse, so it was no longer available. Um, and then the thing with where is everybody, um, and then there's a bit here in terms of background. Uh, in fact, wait a minute, I'll tell you about the plot, then I'll tell you about how it led in. Uh, so we've got the intro of here is, the place is here, the time is now, and the journey into the shadows that we're about to watch could be our journey. Mike Ferris, an amnesiac in an Air Force jumpsuit, finds himself in a town strangely devoid of people. But despite the emptiness, he has the odd feeling that he's being watched. As he inspects the town's cafe, phone booth, police station, drugstore and movie theatre, his desperation mounts. Finally, he collapses, hysterically pushing the walk button of a stoplight again and again. In reality, the walk button is a panic button, and Ferris is an astronaut trainee strapped into an isolation booth in the simulation of a moon flight. After 484 hours in the booth, he has cracked from sheer loneliness. His wanderings in the vacant town have been nothing more than a hallucination. And in the end uh, narration from Serling was up there up there in the vastness of space in the void that is sky up there is an enemy known as isolation it sits there in the stars waiting waiting with the patience of eons forever waiting in the twilight zone uh, so Jeff what did you think of it and then I'll give a bit more info Um, it was kind of a letdown. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's kind of like, that's it. It's just like some experiment about traveling the moon or something. I don't know. Just Well, the next ones are better. They are better because I've seen yeah. the next. Yeah. And yeah. Well, my first thought was I'm not sure this would have been my choice for the first episode. Hmm. <laughs> To get somebody into the show, um, I don't know, because it's like it both takes too long to get going, and then once it does, nothing really happens. So, yeah, uh, and, and I, I know just from my memory, even though it's been a long time since I've seen them, you say, you know, things being better. I remember better ones where they were able to put a whole lot more into the same time period. So I know it's not just the limitations of the time they had. You can do more with that. And if this had been like maybe a um, uh, continuing story where they didn't reveal at the end what was going on, then maybe the, it, it could work as an introduction if you extended it more. But as it is, it's just kind of blah. But, yeah. Um, and I want a chocolate ice cream soda now <laughs> because of that scene in the... Well, well, this is one of your cheat days, so you are allowed to have that, I think, on the weekend. You, uh, uh... No, that was yesterday. <laughs> ah, right. <laughs> well, I've recently become diabetic, so, <laughs> so I can't have anything that's sweet. <laughs> it's terrible. Um, so, um, I've got some interesting things here. Is um, What did you think of the music? Pretty good. So I've got some info about the guy who did the music. Um, uh, it was vital that the look and sound of the show matched the peculiar mood of the writing, so special care was taken in the selection of a director of photography and composer. And then it said here that the, the cinematographer uh, was a guy that had worked on... Uh, oh, it was uh, Joseph Lachelle. What do you think about that shot coming up? You know, when he runs into the mirror. Well, that was pretty well done. That was probably the only um, 
thing that really qualified as like a shocking moment in the whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> because he couldn't exactly see that coming. Yeah. And of course, audience, Jeff and I are tough to please because we've seen so much science fiction. Um, well, and another thing that I thought of was like, I, and I'm sure it'll happen again as I watch more episodes, is that I, I realize how many things since then have parodied Twilight Zone because already with this one, there's two different things I thought of. One was a Simpsons thing that might have been a Halloween episode. I can't remember that mm. that I think parodied this one. And then another one was uh, uh, an Arby's commercial. <laughs> and in that one, they even had the guy say the same, where is everybody line. <laughs> but then the punchline in that is that finally he finds some guy who's eating a roast beef sandwich and the guy tells him, Arby's, roast beef sale. <laughs> <laughs> right um but it's in black and white with the dude running around the town with yeah. deserted you know asking where everybody is so. i thought the i thought the acting was good uh from Hart, and especially like at the end when he's like really upset and he's pressing that i thought that was convincing because he had to show some uh some strong emotion there yeah and it's not easy um you know you talk about the the theme of the episode about like isolation so that it's not easy to monologue to you know act alone where you've got to carry all the story with your, your own dialogue talking basically to yourself that's not that's not an easy thing to do and pull off so gets points uh, for that um rod Serling did in hindsight he didn't like it and he didn't and he didn't like the idea of him talking to himself but i actually think that it's quite clever in the way they get him to talk so, for instance, you, you got him talking to the guy who that he thinks is in the back making the food. Hey, paying customer here. And then they've got this thing right. here where he's talking to the woman, uh, what he thinks is the woman on the phone. And then there's a bit, and usually people will like talk to themselves sometimes if they look in the mirror. So there's lots of little devices that make it plausible. And then there's also what he thought was a woman in the car, but it was a mannequin. So... I thought that worked okay. And then him playing around with the microphone, suspicious character walking around. Um, yeah, so apparently the guy that did the music also did the music for Psycho. Uh, I'll continue. Herman's original theme music for the show, a subtle and lovely piece scored for strings, harp, flutes, and brass, survived through most of the first season. Um, what was interesting, and, and it gives you an idea of, I don't know if it works like this now, Jeff, that when they did the pilot, apparently they, um, once it was ready, they flew it to New York to show it to the um, sponsors. Uh to to see if they uh liked it do they do things like that now because you know quite a bit about television production is it that much on the <laughs> it's like the sponsors decide whether it will go ahead no i don't know anything about television production okay fair enough you're mistaken i just wondered if things had like so when like... you said do people do things like that i was like what do you mean fly Okay. So. Okay. Uh, say when they thought of the Simpsons starting a series, when they took it to Fox, did Fox decide? Because I think in those days they used to have fewer sponsors. Well, yeah. Um, I mean, that's one of the things, I guess. I don't know exactly how that process works, but uh, but yeah, I do know that um, in the early days, especially in radio days, often a program would be would mainly be sponsored by one company so I guess they carried more weight at that time in terms of had to work with their product because sometimes on radio and maybe TV too in the early days the show would actually be the name of the sponsor it would just be like uh, you know the ivory soap show <laughs> Starring George Burns or whatever, you know, where it was like <laughs> the sponsor was the show. It'd be like, it was just featuring some other guy. So you might have Imperial Leather Street, <laughs> whatever the soap's named after, yeah. Um, 
apparently it was produced by his uh, there's some interesting things here about the deal that he got on it so it was produced by his own production company and on the condition that Serling would write 80% of the first season scripts and then here's a key bit in return for this service Serling, was, Serling would own 50% of the series and then this is a key bit from my point of view plus the original negatives so I thought that was a shrewd move uh, it was effective in making me want to go to a movie theater and have a chocolate ice cream soda and uh I don't like eggs over easy, so that part didn't get me as much. But um... right, I'm a, I'm a little bit uh, torn because I think the next one, the next one in broadcast order, is very much more of a character piece. Oh, the third one's good, Mister Denton on Doomsday, the Western. That one's good. Now you see the next one. You see, if we watched it in broadcast order, one for the angels very much is a character piece. Whereas, well, I haven't like looked at anything other than the way it is on Amazon Prime. So, right, that would obviously be the easiest order for me to do, just because that's it's set up that way. But <laughs> if there's something else I need to do to skip around, we can talk about that later, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, it's just that the uh, the second one is called The Lonely <laughs> in production order. So, One for the Angels, very much a character. It, it, it stars Ed Wynn. Do you know him? Uh -uh. Okay. Well, he was an old guy at the time, so he wouldn't have <laughs> lasted much longer. Um, so there was the plot. Then we've got the things here about... Uh, now, I do get the impression that Rod Serling, like his best fit type, was SFP. Um, and apparently, in the original narration, he wrote something about there being a sixth dimension. <laughs> and someone asked him, oh, okay, what are the other five then? And so, it's like there's little things where he doesn't uh, uh, care that much because it's like, oh, it doesn't really matter. Um, well, I did wonder the, the lone. Uh, discussion question, I guess, that I would come up with for this episode would be whether introverts would agree with what or would feel the same way about what he said about like loneliness and isolation. Actually, there's a story later on where Burgess Meredith... No, I'm not talking about later on. I'm talking about this one. <laughs> yeah, but all I'm talking about is that one's where you have an introvert in it and he's glad that nobody else is around. <laughs> But I think maybe some INTJs <laughs> might not be too put out <laughs> by it. Um, but I think maybe it's... I just think that with the introverts, especially with the... Especially the type like INTJ, it's, it's just after a while they might want to talk to somebody. It just wouldn't be as soon. Yeah, so 484 hours, is that the limit? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, what would be hell for them? Would be to be surrounded by a load of no annoying people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's the other thing I thought was like, are they really? T were they really doing this because uh, they were planning on sending somebody to the moon completely by themselves? Is that really what they were planning? Yeah, they were. That he actually read about that. That's a bit that's in the. Um, I I'll tell you a, a bit about that in the moment because I've. It's in the in the book. I mean, was it just like a cost issue? They figured they wouldn't be able to afford more because that doesn't make sense on any level other than that. Well, I, th I think maybe because well, they did send Yuri Gagarin into space on his own, and then I think what was it, Alan Shepard for the United States went on his own. I don't know who the first American was in space. Um. So I don't know anything. So, right, okay. I'll, just, so I'll just save you the time of asking me questions okay. about things. So, uh, in terms of where we got the title from, asked how he came up with the title, Serling said, I thought I'd made it up, but I heard that there is an Air Force term relating to the moment when the plane is coming down on approach and it cannot see the horizon, and it's called the Twilight Zone, but it's an obscure term which I had not heard of before. Um, apparently... 
they wanted Orson Welles to do the voiceover, but he he was asking for so much money that the sponsors didn't want to pay all that amount. So eventually, the uh, the agent of Rod Serling suggests that he do it. Uh, did he suggest? Oh no, Rod made himself the suggestion that he would do the voiceover. Right, and then he says here that yes, uh, he said that he read an item in Time magazine that isolation experiments were being performed on astronaut trainees. Uh, this was then coupled with a purely subjective experience on his part. And then this is quoting him. I got the idea while walking through an empty lot of a movie studio. There were all the evidences of a community, but with no people. I felt at the time a kind of encroaching loneliness and desolation, a feeling of how nightmarish it would be to wind up in a city with no inhabitants. Um, and see, that's the funny thing because even I'm not an introvert, and I didn't. That's not my immediate thinking of it being nightmarish. I I just want to like. It makes me want to be there, like, and just be able to do what I wanted in the city. Ooh. <laughs> Like, use all the things like he did, you know, just be like, you know, I, I, obviously at some point it would run out, but at yeah. least at the beginning, my, <laughs> my thinking isn't like in the future, it's just in what I could do then without anybody stopping me. So if it was you, then it was like you're enjoying yourself doing all the stuff, and then, and then what would the caption be a month later, a week later? Yeah, I don't know, <laughs> however long it took. <laughs> like, I mean, I'd get lonely too, but like my first thought is i'd have the freedom to do a lot of stuff so. yeah yeah and then this is the bit where you'll like this bit because he agrees with you <laughs> rod serlin um over the years serlin became increasingly dissatisfied with where is everybody commenting in 1975 that unlike good wine this film hasn't taken the years <laughs> very well at all uh certainly and then this, this goes back to the writer, Mark Scott Zakri. Um, certainly, almost as soon as he finished writing the episode, he must have been unhappy with the totally straightforward ending, devoid of any twists or surprises. But when he adapted the script into a short story for his collection, Stories from the Twilight Zone, Phantom 1960, he altered it, beginning at the point where Ferris enters a movie theatre. So what I'm going to do now is I'll describe how Serling changed it, and then you can let me know whether you think it's better or not. Um, when he goes into the theatre, Serling later explained, there's nobody giving tickets. So he reaches in and takes a ticket and he walks in and tears off the stub and drops one in the little reticule there and puts the other stub in his pocket. And then you play the whole thing. And when he gets out of the isolation booth, and they're carrying him on this stretcher, he reaches into his pocket, and there's a theatre stub. Now, it doesn't mean anything except, wait a minute, bang, what happened there? It's a Philip upon a Philip. So, what do you think of that, that version? I mean, <laughs> like you said, it doesn't mean anything, but that would have been a little, just sort of throwing a bone to people who like there, for there to be some kind of mysterious element like that you know yeah but i think for me and yeah and that doesn't make sense <laughs> where is the logic of it? right it's kind of <laughs> like you know some people would have that reaction so but uh, you know i think it would be you know speaking of experiments it would be interesting to present this to you know people that uh, i guess were confirmed certain types just mm -hmm. to kind of see what their reaction to the situation would be not not just you know reviewing the episode as television but in terms of just the setting in terms of what happened, like how, what we just talked about earlier, like how, what our first impressions of being in that situation would be, that sort of thing. That's what I liked about the ending of uh, the time element, because I thought the ending was logically well worked out. Uh, and those little things of him being there with the lighter and then going and then seeing him on the wall. And I thought this is one of these rare like Back to the Future Part Two where they get the time travel stuff right. Yeah, I think there was <laughs> there was moments in this where I was like my mind was almost trying to invent more of something of a twist that wasn't there. Like I when he uh saw the police station 
I was like, wait a minute, was that police station there when he went to the phone booth? <laughs> but I think it probably was. It just didn't, there wasn't anything that jumped out about me. But I was thinking first, uh, you know, was, I was thinking, well, that would be something cool if there, like the town was actually changing while he was walking around. Like things were basically appearing that he was thinking of needing or something like that, you know? And, ah. But they didn't really, they didn't really do anything to confirm that. They just had, you know, it was just like, he didn't notice it before or whatever. Yeah. Um, some of the bits I've highlighted, um, particularly galling to Serling. Uh, I'll say that again. Particularly galling to Serling later was a dramatic device that he employed in the episode in order to advance the plot, that of an endless monologue on part of the main character. Um... So he just thought that wasn't realistic, but I thought that was okay with the various devices to try and get him to talk. And plus, people can get so lonely that they just feel like talking. Um, for all its faults, Where Is Everybody accomplished one thing that perhaps no other episode of The Twilight Zone could have done. It sold the series. A number of other episodes might have been superior in terms of drama or imagination, but they would almost certainly have seemed too far out to ever sell this unique series to such a conservative to such conservative executives. Even as it was, there was there were questions as to whether the Twilight Zone was really viable. Say is Agent Ira Steiner. While it was a stunning pilot, it nevertheless was, I guess in today's words, a little freaky in terms of the kind of show that was usually brought in for the viewer. Um I mean, somebody said here, so we felt that it was a very good film, but whether the sponsors would believe we could duplicate it with different stories and different actors was the question in everybody's mind. And then they sort of discussed, you know, why did the series, why was the series made? Like, with all of these elements, such as like, it's anthology, you've not got a, a star that continues every episode. Why did it get made? And so there's a couple of theories here. Uh, uh, and then somebody was saying about a book, Houghton, who was the producer of the series, said that he believes that the Twilight Zone sold primarily due to Serling's reputation. You see, Rod had muscle from the Playhouse 90s he'd done, and the network wanted to hold on to him. Oh, yeah, so he had a theory here that they would just sort of indulge him to make this thing in order to keep hold of him and then there's a little bit here that he put uh, this has been done so many times before where a man has a certain strength and you introduce and sorry I'll say that again this is talking about how studios keep on to writers this has been done so many times before where a man has a certain strength and you induce him to join your club with all sorts of promises intending to use him in his area of strength and indulge him in the areas he's interested in, but no one gives a shit about. <laughs> uh, nobody but a guy with the muscle that Rod had could have gotten a science fiction series launch. They were very, very touchy about it. And then somebody else disagreed. Um, and they said that they just thought it was that they thought it was good because, and they made this good point Rod's written a lot of pilots that didn't get made. Um, and so they think there's four elements in the series getting made um, look, Serling's name and the quality of the show that sold the Twilight Zone and perhaps a fourth factor should be added to this list push, a number of people besides Serling had to push to, with all their talent and influence to get the series on right then um Yeah, uh, the ending was a little bit disappointing, but I, I do think it was well done with uh, the device of getting him to talk. Uh, and it is one of those ones that doesn't have that much rewatch value. But uh, I think it's okay. I think one for the angels, isn't it? But really, I'd like to do it in production order but you know if just watching it in um uh 
broadcast order. I don't mind. Uh, like I said, I don't know what order it's in. I just uh, so we uh, can talk about that later if we can figure, yeah, okay. we figure it out. But right, so uh, I've not got much else to say about this. Uh, anything left for you to say, Jeff? Nope. Right then, I will stop the review, people. Thank you.